All right, you guys ready? Wah! So, this is replacing Google Part 1, Analytics GTalk, and Calendar. Hopefully we can get through all of that. It's kind of a follow-up to a series that wasn't named when we replaced Google Reader with Tiny Tiny RSS back when we were forced to because they killed it. And so before they could kill other things, I decided to replace them. So the first one on our list is Google Analytics. And our replacement for that is Pwik. I don't actually know how to pronounce it. Pywik, Pwik, Pwik. So, let's give this a go. Where's my thing? So uh, here I've got a virtual machine. I've already installed Apache PHP and MySQL. Um, if we go over here, we can go to the installation guide. It requires a web server, PHP, and MySQL and the MySQL extensions for PHP. So, we'll get this figured out. I am going to jump into root, so I don't have to type a bunch of stuff. So we'll go into MySQL with these initial startup start instructions and create a database. Create the user, make sure to change your password. And grant permissions. To the database. And plus the privileges. Alright, now we'll come over to the installing guide. This one is actually really easy. So I've downloaded the zip here, so we shall. Uh oh. I knew there was something I forgot to set up. What was that? I forgot to install on zip. So we will unzip this thing. And it created a folder called Pwik. And we will change the owner to Apache so this will work and then we'll jump over here and go to Quick. So this has a nice little wizard install. So we click next we get our little system check. It checks to make sure we have everything installed. We're missing the optional GD library but that's okay. Asks for our database information Oh, it's a password. And it will go ahead and create all the tables we need. And then asks for our admin user. And then you set up your first website. So, you know, my website is at example.com. It's located in Denver, and it's not an e-commerce site. And here we have the JavaScript tracking code for it. So we'll jump over here and edit our lovely index.html to have that. And we'll 
click next, and we're done. Cool. We now basically have our own hosted analytics. So if we jump over here and maybe reload it, you can see that our tracking code is in our index page. And it probably won't show up here that quickly it never does. And so here's your dashboard. You can pretty much customize all these widgets. Let's um, jump into their demo so you can see some data in here. If the internet works. Um, so we'll jump in and look at the settings real quick. So you have your website, so you can come in here and oh, nice screen size, and add a new website, so you can track multiple websites. You can add users, both normal and super users, that can log in to see all the data. You have your own user settings. Your tracking code again. You can do both JavaScript and image tracking. You can also import server logs. Oh, I keep getting confused by that. Um, <clears throat> if you have access to a geolocation database, you can load it in so that its IP resolution is a little bit better. Well, that's no bueno. There it goes. All right. So here's a demo with data. So you can see, this is kind of how I have mine usually looking. You get your, your visits over the past month, all the keywords that were used for searching. It'll show you visitors in real time. So it'll kind of show you the last 30 minutes and 24 hours and what page they're on and kind of their system stats. Uh, you've got your referring websites, you've got your visitor map, your browsers, your search engines, Bing's not doing too well, <laughs> time they visited, and you can, it's got a whole ton of widgets you can add in, so if you wanted to be able to, on the dashboard, see like, the visitors operating systems you can add that right in there and this pretty much gives you you know all the data you expect to see all your your visitor numbers time spent on site page views your device types your operating systems your browsers your locations out of Germany and the US. You get your what pages were viewed, your entry pages, exit pages. You can tie it into your site search so you know what people search for. You get your refers, whether it's a search engine website or direct entry. You can set up goals. comes with a ton of plugins pre-installed to collect all sorts of data. You can also, you've got a big marketplace where you can find even more plugins. If you're going to set it up, I recommend installing this security info plugin. It gives you this kind of quick overview of the security of like your PHP and all that stuff so you can 
set it up to be secure. And that's more or less quick. They've got, you know, there's plugins for like WordPress and whatnot that you can just drop the plugin in and it'll show like your graphs inside of WordPress and automatically set up all your tracking codes and stuff there. Uh, they have mobile applications that you can use to like see your statistics on the go, like this. Um, there, wherever I was before, the user guides are quite, quite nice. They've, you know, they've got the install guide and the integration guide for integrating with different stuff. They've also got optimization guides. So if you're run, so if you're running this for a site with a lot of traffic, you can optimize quick to be. A little bit faster than it is by default. And oh. And so that's quick. And so now you're thinking, well, if you're moving from Google Analytics, how do you get your data over? And we found this. It's Google too quick. <laughs> this is a nice little well, I say nice. This is a Python script that will rip your data out of the Google Analytics API and import it into your Quick installation. Um, it's kind of a pain in the butt to use, quite frankly, but luckily you should only have to do it once. Um, the basic setup is you have to go to Google's API console, which you need to be logged in for, and set up a API key for Google Analytics. And then you give that API key to the script here. And you give it your quick installation details and pick your start date and give it a run. The thing you have to watch out for though is that with Google API rate limits you to like 10,000 queries in a day and this importer uses a ton of queries and I actually had to do like six month chunks per day of importing so it took a week to import all my Google Analytics over and it works all right you know it gets your basic information of like who visited when and what pages and what were the browser stats and that kind of generic information. And once you've done that, you have your own analytics and you can delete your Google Analytics account. Any questions? Um, are there any disadvantages of uh Leaving the G monster behind. You have to you have to run your own software. Well, of course. So that's either a do it yourself or it's either an advantage or a disadvantage. Only you know, we can do that. You know, like <laughs> if, you, doing that. if you're going to set this up, I recommend you know having an HTTPS set up with it. So you need to buy SSL certificates, typically. Oh, um, speaking of which. Where do you recommend for SSL certificates? Uh, I get free ones from a place called Start SSL. Oh, yeah. They'll, they'll give you a free one for a year. It's a pain in the butt to d deal with. I think it's startssl.net. To, to set it up with that? Yeah. It's a pain. It can, it's kind of a pain in the butt. Their oh. interface isn't too friendly. SSL is all around. Yeah. But, I mean, they give you a one year free certificate that works in all browsers, so it's kind of worth the hassle if you don't want to pay. If you are paying, it's just kind of, eh, whoever. At the end of the year, you go get another? Yep. <laughs> Whoever's cheapest at the time. Whoever's cheapest at the time. And then, you know, I don't know, like, if you, you know, 
if you were setting this up for like a company and they had like an analytics person that knew Google, they probably wouldn't be too happy having to use this thingy. But I've enjoyed it, you know. It gives me the basic numbers that I needed. If you were like using Google Ads, it would start to like give you crappy ads, would they? <laughs> because they don't know what people are searching for mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. Yep. There's no ads though. What ads? And so, so yeah, so that's quick. That's, that's kind of the easy one. It all gets progressively harder as we go oh, down right. <laughs> as we go down this line. All right. So moving to the next thing, GTalk. So GTalk is based roughly around a thing known as XMPP, aka Jabber. Stands for the Extensible Messaging and Presence Protocol. Um, so GTalk is is based on Jabber, and they added a lot of features to the Jabber spec when they wrote it, but they're kind of moving away from supporting XMPP with their new Hangout system. And <coughs> they actually were going to completely remove their XMPP support, but people kind of got a little outraged, and so they're it's still hanging around, but it's still not the greatest thing ever. So, when it comes to XMPP, there's kind of four major servers. You have eJabberD, which is an, written in Erlang and kind of the original-ish implementation of a lot of the specs. Uh, you have Jabber 2, which I believe is written in C. Yeah. Then you have OpenFire, which is written in Java. And Prosody, which is rather new, but is written in Lua. And so we're going to set up Prosody because it's, it's rather simplistic. You know, it doesn't have a lot of the baggage that, like, eJabbered has from all the, like, obsolete and rejected specs that they've implemented over the years. So we'll jump over here to Prosody. So for installation, we can probably, I think I need this installation guide. So you can pull it from your, your repo, but you know, they tend to lag a little bit behind. Ubuntu's currently got 8.2, and the latest is 9 point, or 0.9 something. 0.93, yeah. So we are going to add Prosody's package repository to our system. So, we add their repository to our list. We import their key. And then we update aptitude. And hope the internet works. Ever so slowly. Three hundred k seconds, not good enough for you. <laughs> Mine goes a little faster. <laughs> Me. 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 I watch the pictures grow. See now we're now we're at fifty six k.
I don't want an aptitude update. <laughs> Watching the grass growing some. Watching the mine doesn't. Windows 98 frag. That was actually kind of pretty. Yeah. yeah. Well, better than a screensaver. You know that it's doing something. You know. I questioned it a lot. Your mic be slightly faster, maybe. Oh yeah, this is going to be so great when it's finally all these frag, it's going to be so fast. 12 hours later. <laughs> 12 hours, you had a hard drive that took 12 hours. Lucky. <laughs> I mean, you must, you must have had a humongous 20 megabyte hard drive. <laughs> yeah, it stopped being fun when hard drives reach a terabyte. <laughs> <laughs> So, we will install Procity. Procity, I don't know how to pronounce it. And that is installed. So, if we take a look in Etsy Procity, we have this config Lua file. Oh wow. <laughs> it's all purple. <laughs> well, how do I do this? Syntax So this is a file that you can't really see because the monitor is ever so perfect. <laughs> uh so this is a Lua config file. So if you know Lua, it's fairly simple, but it's a fairly simple config file. Um, you have admins. Uh, these aren't really required for using it. This is just if you want to use the admin capabilities from like a Jabber client. So oh, really, app get installed was all it took? Yep. Huh, how oh, nice. Oh, package man. Uh, packages. Uh, we've got, you know, it has a list of modules, so by default you've got your roster, which allows you to s have users, kind of useful. Um, your SAS auth TLS, server-to-server -server dialback, POSIX functionality, vCard support, private storage, a whole bunch of stuff. and other stuff you can enable. Um, you'll notice allow registration is <coughs> set to false. Uh, if you turn that on, it allows anybody to create an account against your server. What could go wrong? Eh, not much. <laughs> um, you can set it up to require an encrypted connection from the client to the server. So if you've got your SSL set up properly, this is kind of a nice thing to have. So then all your all your communication between your Jabber client and the Jabber server are encrypted. Um, you can also set up encryption between server to server. Um, it's nice to have, but it'll break a lot of things, especially Google. They don't speak encryption on their servers at all for Jabber. So probably good to leave that off or do something like this where you whitelist G Gmail from having a secure connection. And then, you know, you got some logging settings, and that's a lot of what it is. Um, hang on, I gotta. I forgot the line I need to add. All very. Very annoying. Okay. So here's your virtual host, which basically says what domains you're set up on. Oh, hang on. Let me do this. I'll do this instead.
come back here to our guide. So now that we've got it installed, we can jump over to the configure step. And basically what you need to do is add your host, which says, you know, what domain are you serving? So you can do that in the, the main config file, but I like to do it in this etsyprocity conf.d directory. And for some reason, this version doesn't have that included, so you have to have this include conf.d directive to load additional files in there. Then we will, so I like to set up, you know. What's happening? We're creating a directory for something? For Apache? For Prosody. Yeah, it's similar to Apache. Yeah. Similar to Apache. So, so instead of saying, you know, putting our server configs in the main file, we're going to put them in this. Oh, you're splitting them out into yeah, a separate Yeah, we're going to put them in this conf.d directory that's in it. And this tells the main config file to load anything that's in that folder. So we'll set like up a. So in that comp.d, we'll create like an example.net.cfg.lua file. In here, we will say virtual host example.net. And with that, all we should need to do is restart the service, and that should be good. Then we need to create our accounts. So since we have registration turned off, we can't register through the in-band client registration. So we're going to use this Prosody control to add our user. So we basically say prosody control add user me at example.net. So this is going to be your Jabber ID that you use. It's going to ask for the password and that user is now created. So now we can open our KDE IM client says we don't have an account configured, so we will add an account. XMPP say that our Jabber ID is me at example.net. Put in our password. And then, since I don't actually control example.net, I need to put the server in. And I'm going to ignore SSL errors because the host name doesn't match. And we say finish. And it connects and we're online. So now we have Jabber. So now we can add basically, you know, friend at gmail.com. Is it Gmail? Yeah or any other Jabber server that your friends use, and you have your Jabber chat. Is that what you have set up? Yep, that's what I run through Prosody. And it works most of the time. Yeah. Except when your Gmail client sends it something weird and then it locks into thinking that you're permanently online and it gets all confused. <laughs> that's the only problem I've had with it. Other than that, it's fantastic and a lot easier to use than eJabbered. eJabbered together in like Erlang before you can know how to use it. <laughs> so they can stay and everything. Yeah. I'll just set up something. My computer's mostly up and running again. Huh? My computer's mostly up and running again. I would just put that on my little... Uh, put it on your VPS, VPS if you don't use. A tiny... tiny <laughs> so, that is Prosody and XMPP. Any questions?
settings. Uh, do you have an actual Gabber address? I do. So I have that set up and running against my server, basically. It's all, it's all good and fun. And now we come to the very, very, very difficult one. <laughs> Calendar. So when you start looking into replacing something like Google Calendar, you kind of have two options. One is just kind of a web app that's a calendar that you can go on the web and use its little interface, and that's about all it does. And it's so-so. The other one is to set up a CalDAV server, which just runs CalDAV, and then you have to have a separate client. But that works nice with if you have something like an Android phone and you're used to, you know, being connected to Google's calendar from your phone. So in that space, there's kind of two servers that you can use. One is called Davical, I think. Yeah. Davical. It's kind of the original implementation of things. But it needs Postgres and PHP to run. And I didn't feel like setting it up because it looked rather big. So the new and hip contender is Radical. So this is, you know, a CalDAV, ser a CalDAV and CardDAV server, which does contact stuff, uh, written in Python. So we'll jump over, look at the install instructions. You can pull it from pip. That'll get you the newest version. Uh, but then you have to know how to set up like init files and stuff. I've never heard of pip. What's that? That is the Python it's just the package, package repository. I don't know what it stands for. <laughs> oh, so it's like it's like NPM for no Bungalers. So it's just so you know. It's a different kind of package manager, but only for Python. Yeah, so it's a repository for software written in Python, basically. Yeah. So that'll get you the latest version, but I don't feel like messing with it. So we're just gonna install the slightly older version that Ubuntu has from its repos. I installed the Python dash radical one. First, and for, trying to figure out why I couldn't find the net file forever. And I was like, oh, it's in a different package. So I installed there it, but did that. not. Huh? There is that. Yeah. So something was missing from the package that way? No, I just did things wrong because I'm dumb. I think I understand how Python packaging works, but I don't. So I installed it, but you can see that it didn't start it because it's disabled by the stupid default config files which is not my friend. So you got to come in here and comment that out to enable Radical. Seems like a weird default. Yeah, I yeah. intentionally install it, but we have it right. Yeah, that's kind of a weird thing. I'd... On the one hand, if you install it, you kind of want it to run. But on the other hand, if something installs a dependency you don't want that to run so it's kind of give and take I think so now that we have that done we will start that bad boy up and now we have a radical or a CalDAV server um, we can look at the config file this one's still a little bit new to me and I haven't played with it a ton and so it's got, it's got kind of a big config file. Um, you know, by default runs on port 5232. Uh, you got your SSL settings. Um, it has various authentication systems. So, you know, you got none, HTTPD, password, HTTP password. 
LDAP, PAM, Courier. Um, I want to say that the newer version has slightly different authentication protocols. Yeah, so they got like an HTTP and an IMAP one. Um, probably a good thing to set up if you're going to run it yourself to make sure you know you've got a, a strong security system. I'm not going to bother with it because it's a pain. Um, you know, by default it stores this information just in a folder there and you're logging. <coughs> so I'm going to need this and we will fire up K organizer. Uh, let's put this over. Come on. Come on. I can do it. Come down here. Over here. Alright. Alright, we'll put this up here. So we'll go to settings, configure K organizer, calendars, uh, add. Dav. So then it asks for your login credentials. So since we don't have anything set up, it's going to just use our Unix credentials, which are just going to be the Vagrant credentials. Uh, figure this manually. Finish. What happens? Uh, then we put in our. Display name, username, password, add, caldav, and then this is the URL to the calendar. And then two that one six eight that three three that ten. Username vagrant. Uh, and click fetch and click that and click OK, 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 calendar. So that's just the like default open uh, KDE yeah, it's, client? Yeah, it's just the calendar built into KDE and you know they've got instructions for Mozilla Lightning, GNOME, Evolution, KDE, K Organizer. Uh, these are a bunch of clients for Android, yeah. Apple iPhone. So, do those, you know if those Android clients integrate with the, the calendar like overriding the system stuff? Um, I know that some, some apps like can override that. I don't know. If I would look into any of them, I'd look into ACAL. I think it's probably the best one there. But now we have our calendar set up. So you know we can from here add an event for tomorrow. And there's our event. I see something on that other page called card dab. Is that like a address book server? Yeah. Um yeah it's like your contacts address book type server. Um, I haven't played around with it so I couldn't tell you anything about how it functions. But yeah, so that's all nice and great if you're using like a desktop client or a client from your phone or anything. But say you want a web client. All right. Well, we have one of those. It's called a GenDAV. Um, so you can see, uh, this was last released October 2012, which is a little bit ago. Um, so it's stable. Sure. Uh, you can pull the code from, from GitHub, which was last changed two days ago, if you want to live the beta lifestyle. 
Um, we're just going to use the released 1262. So we'll hide that for now. So I've got that version pulled down. So we shall extract it. And then we'll move the folder to just agenda. Now this is this is a let's see, we've probably got documentation here. We'll look through that. So this needs a CalDAV server. They develop mainly with Davical. A web server, PHP, and either MySQL or Postgres. Um, and this is where we get into some not fun things because this is like your old school PHP configure it yourself, no pretty, pretty wizard to go through. So we've downloaded the package and extracted it. So now we will set up the database for it. So. So we'll create everything, we'll create the user, and we'll create the database, which that didn't work out well. Create the database, but it already exists. And then we'll flush the privileges. So now the database is created. So now we will load in the schema file. Oh, change our folder first. So we've loaded the schema file. This is where things get kind of crazy. So the actual code is in web. And so if you're setting up Apache, I'm just skipping this. You want to point it to web public, your virtual host, or alias the path to it. I'm skipping that because I don't feel it's necessary. And then we will come into this web config folder. So this has a lot of config files. Well, what we're going to need to do is copy the config.php template to config.php, copy the caldev template to caldev.php, and copy the database template to database.php. Then we need to first start by configure oh I just broke it. First start by configuring our database file. So we will put in username database and our password. And then just because loading our schema file wasn't enough, we have to run this database upgrade command. To update our database. And then we have to edit this caldev.php config file. This is where things get a little confusing. Um, so this needs two URLs. It needs the caldev principal URL and the caldev calendar URL. Uh, what's the principal? That is a good question. So I've discovered <coughs> that if you put in this URL and remove the calendar portion 
we change that to their little percent U thing. And put in your IP. And then change this calendar URL to have this percent %s and your IP that it should work. So if you set up your Apache right, you could just go to the URL and use it, but I didn't, so we'll have to go here. So this brings you to here. Again, the login is whatever your CalDev server is set up to accept. So on this, it's going to be the Vagrant credentials. Is that the one I need? No. Ah, yes. So if both these both these URLs, if you just strip off the calendar ICS from the Radical URL and replace the username with their little placeholder, then it works. So now, when we come here, we've loaded up, and we can see we have our event that we added from the desktop client. And this, you know, this supports your general, you know, you're taking a vacation there, and you know, you got a meeting on Friday. So, you know, it's got kind of that Ajaxy Google Calendar fill. Um, it supports multiple calendars, so you can, you know, have kid stuff over there. Got your multiple calendars. Got your selector, your dates. That's pretty much it. Um, if you come back in here, you can check out this. config file, this is, you know, a giganticness of PHP config things, you know, you've got your logs, your encryption key, your cookie information, proxy IPs, uh, you got your site title, so you probably want to change that to something like, suck it, Google. <laughs> remove the footer, but you know, it's got all sorts of stuff. Default language, default time format, time, oh. more time format. I always think about time formats. Put that uh, gear first. Your various colors that are supported. I'm sure it's going to be CSS or something. <laughs> and yeah. We've now replaced three Google services with ones we control. Any questions on that? Show me the terminal. Let's see, so you, uh, you edited the database. Yep. To give it like, uh, what, the user credential? Yeah, and so if we, we take a look at the database one, we just had to put in our the basic credentials. Basic credentials. And then there's that CalDAV one where you at least need this principal URL and this calendar URL. Um, it has some other stuff for like sharing and probably also the authentication type if you're using one of the other different ones. And then that config PHP that has tons of configuration files that you may or may not need. There's also an advanced configuration file if you're feeling dangerous. Uh, you probably need to understand how 
CodeIgniter works if you want to play with that file. And that's pretty much it. Like I say, this version is about two years old. I haven't played with the new one yet. Your mileage may vary with that one. Maybe they have a nice installer. Maybe. <laughs> That, include, that concludes three of placing three of Google services. Stay tuned for the future when we replace more of them. <laughs> <G -maps. laughs> that one might be trickier. <laughs>